Hi, hello. Uh, I don't see myself. I hope that you can see me and you can hear me. Can you? Excellent. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, for us, it's a morning. For you, it's uh, noon time. So uh, I hope that I won't take too much time before lunch. And uh, I was requested to talk about uh, Digital Living 2030. Uh, Digital Living 2030 is a project that uh, Tel Aviv University runs with uh, Stanford. And specifically, I will talk about uh, the role and the challenges of uh, artificial intelligence in this project. <clears throat> now, um, I'm uh, running the uh, lab uh, of AI, machine learning, business and data analytics at Tel Aviv University. This is Lambda, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Lambda, then talk about uh, the project, uh, the main um, challenges that we are facing and uh, I will hopefully be able to give at least one or two uh, examples of applications uh, within this project. And then we can summarize and have some questions. Um, any remark or questions about the agenda? <clears throat> okay. Please feel free guys to stop me at any time. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Lambda is the laboratory of AI machine learning, business and data analytics at the University uh, of Tel Aviv, the Faculty of Engineering. And what we try to do is to uh, uh, get inspiration and uh, a real problem from the industry uh, and combine it in, uh, in an academic research. Uh, you can see uh, some of the companies that we are working with. There are uh, actually many others, some of them in the area of uh, telecommunication, um, transportation, retail, uh, banking, and so on. And uh, the idea is that uh, uh, if there is a problem that is significant and hard enough to uh, justify a thesis, then uh, we form a group of uh, uh, the student and the supervisor. Uh, I have some of my colleagues participating in this effort, including um, a representative from the company that can provide data and, and insight about the problem. And the type of problems that we are addressing are uh, quite uh, uh, diverse. We are, for example, talking right now uh, with companies and uh, conducting research around the uh, human mobility patterns. Maybe I can show part of it uh, uh, in smart cities, anomaly detection in uh, production lines uh, and in smart cities, process monitoring, uh, sensor and feature selection, uh, more theoretical work around a deep learning that is uh, related to a financial time series and uh, how much information you can gain from one financial time series about the other. Uh, wireless body uh, area network uh, uh, is a project that I will talk more about it. HR analytics, diffusion of information in social networks, cybersecurity, uh, and many, many, many more. So. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, the, uh, the part that uh, uh, represent all those projects is the idea that uh, we combine data science uh, with applications, uh, industrial or service applications, uh, with strong emphasis on the usage by, uh, by, by people. Now, <clears throat> digital living came from... Uh, the thought that uh, we are all aware that uh, reality is changing and changing fast. It's uh, you know, amazing to think that uh, 10 to 15 years ago, there were no uh, uh, iPhones. Uh, so people were uh, actually working, entertaining, interacting uh, in, a, in a very different way than it is uh, today. So we all know how um, it changed our life. 
And the same way if you think about uh, companies and innovation in companies, uh, you can realize that uh, things were changing quite rapidly in the last uh, decades. Uh, and there is a shift towards digitization. Uh, so, you know, if you look at, uh, and we looked at articles that describe innovation uh, around those years that you can see in the screen, you know, in the 80s you could see many companies that are basically a uh, physical company. They deal with energy, they deal with uh, you know, vehicles, they deal with, with artifacts. Uh, they are all present in the physical world. So you can find General Motors, uh, General Electric, uh, Exxon Mobile, Ford Motors, and so on. Then uh, a decade later, you can see a lot of innovation in companies that opened uh, the digital area. In the beginning, it, it was uh, the hardware company like HP and IBM and Intel and Dell and, and more. And then came a software company like uh, Apple and Microsoft and Google and, and, and so on. And um, what you can uh, see in the last decade is that uh, many of the innovative companies are actually playing both in the physical world and in the digital world. So basically companies like Amazon are extremely interesting, not only uh, due to the fact that they have a search engine and a very strong presence uh, in the internet, but at the same time, they hold maybe the largest supply chain uh, on the planet. So this combination of uh, digital presence and physical uh, um, infrastructure is making Amazon uh, a, such a large company. Um, if you look at Alibaba, uh, the way that they, uh, in one hand, they started as a, an internet company, but the way that they proceed now uh, to physical retail and to physical um, interactions uh, with businesses, uh, you can realize that they are also uh, moving towards this di direction. Google, if you think about Google, Google started as a software company, but today it became Alphabet, and they are suddenly dealing with uh, autonomous vehicle and uh, things that are actually in the physical world. So they took uh, the, the reverse path from the digital to the, physipa, to the, to the uh, uh, physical. Uber, of course, is a very good example because, uh, again, they solve a physical problem. They move people from place to place or they move uh, um, packages or, or uh, uh, materials from place to place. However, uh, they do it in a digital way. They, they map the physical world into the digital space. Uh, they solve the problem of uh, how best uh, they can uh, transfer people and material from place A to place B. And then they send back the solution as an instructions to the drivers that can uh, actually execute it in the physical world. So basically, the idea of uh, all those companies, including uh, companies that uh, um, started in Israel, startups uh, like Waze and Mobileye, is to take uh, a problem which is physical, model it in a digital world, solve it very fast, and then project back the solution to the physical world. This is basically the essence of uh, modeling that we see around us. And of course, <coughs> when you do uh, such a, a process, <coughs> the main uh, tool to solve the problem in a digital world, uh, in many cases, rely on AI. The AI is actually the brain where you try to solve a problem uh, in the digital space, you need AI. And, and, uh, and this is uh, basically uh, the environment that we find ourselves uh, living. And this was uh, the background that led us to uh, um, launch this uh, Digital Living 2030 project. Any question about... Uh, uh, this slide or anything else. Okay, so Digital uh, Living 2030 
uh, was launched uh, by Tel Aviv University in Stanford, uh, led at Stanford by Professor Nick Bambos, and in Tel Aviv by myself, with a very long list of uh, uh, distinguished uh, researchers, uh, and some of them you can see in the picture, and you can have uh, also the names. Uh, and the idea was that we are going to form groups uh, around three buckets of uh, uh, issues. I'll, I'll talk about it in a moment. And we are going to create an uh, indisciplinary group that uh, uh, have basically a different type of researchers. Some of the guys are data science, so they know how to deal with a large amount of data uh, and map, you know, again, the physical world to the digital space and, and so on. Some of them are applied mathematicians, uh, OR people, operation research, because when you solve the problem, uh, once you have it in a digital way, you need the mathematical formulation and optimization. And part of the guys are uh, human factor people. So people that uh, um, take into account that eventually all those innovations uh, will result in some application where a human being with a, a critical part is the main user, is the main uh, um, uh, attention of uh, the application, and you need to build the application in a, in a, in a correct way such that uh, uh, it can use it in a, in a, in a, in a cost-effective uh, manner. <clears throat> and this is a, this blend of people, data scientists, applied mathematicians, and uh, OR and human factors uh, is something that we found uh, to be very relevant for this project and uh, something that um, is also um, represent well uh, the faculty uh, members in Tel Aviv and uh, in Stanford in the department of uh, uh, in Tel Aviv in the department of uh, industrial engineering and at, in Stanford in the department of management science and engineering. Now, uh, as I mentioned, we thought that um, we should divide the research, those research teams, to address uh, three main topics. Uh, although I must say that uh, as we proceed, the borders or the lines between those areas are uh, getting uh, uh, blurry and, and we find research that is actually related to some of them, sometime all of them together. But the idea was to have research around smart environment and infrastructure. So all uh, the physical and the digital networks that enable application like uh, smart tra transportation, smart cities, uh, smart mobility, and so on. So this is the first part of the bucket. I don't know if you can see, do you see my mouse? Can you see my mouse? No, I think that... So this is the environmental infrastructure triangle that you see on the right uh, lower corner. Then uh, there is this um, social organization uh, triangle that focuses around new social infrastructure that can support interactions be between people. So, you know, if, you, if we think about uh, social networks today, they are mainly used to share information, to share uh, experiences, uh, to share stories, if you want. Uh, however, we are still not in a position where we are using those large infrastructure to support a real decision process. Think about... Uh, running a small um, you know, neighborhood. Can you use a social network to uh, enable each uh, citizen in that in a neighborhood to take part in the decision uh, that are taking, uh, uh, that are taken? So for example, which roads to open, which roads to develop, uh, how to build uh, you know, a kindergarten or, a, or you know, a garden in the city. All those... Uh, 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 decisions that usually are left to uh, the representative that uh, uh, once in a few years you are replacing could be uh, 
represented in a dynamic environment where people can actually either themselves or their agents, their AI agent can take part and, and interact and make uh, a lot of decisions. So uh, I'm talking about a neighborhood, but in fact it can be at a level of a country. Uh, again, we all are used to uh, select our representative and uh, I know that both uh, India and Israel, we had uh, election uh, not far away and then, you know, for four years we are uh, left behind and uh, our representative are, are making the decision, but in fact, we could, if we can train an AI agent that represent our need, um, it could be part of uh, a longer decision process, a dynamic decision process that is uh, happening all the time. And um, when you do so, there are a lot of questions that are suddenly um, um, jump into, uh, into one's mind. The first is, you know, how to construct it, not only efficiently from uh, the engineering side, but how to do it uh, in, while you consider ethical decision. You can think about many of those decisions that can be taken instantaneously. So, for example, a dynamic uh, uh, a light system in the road. Can you take a lot of information and, and change it uh, in, uh, dynamically in a way that... Uh, uh, some people will gain more, uh, uh, you know, a, f a, f a faster access to the road while others not. Can you do it in an ethical way? So many questions that are not only focused on engineering. When you talk about social infrastructure and decision making are, are relevant. I'll talk more about it maybe at the end if, if we can, uh, if we have time to talk about a specific application when we try to... Uh, address uh, an interesting question. Is uh, wisdom of the crowd always uh, a good uh, scheme to make a uh, you know, uh, decision in larger scale? Or are there a better and smarter ways to make a decision uh, and under which circumstances? So all of it is around the social uh, infrastructure that will represent our lives uh, in, uh, let's say, 10, 15 years. This is why it is called Digital Living 2030. In the last bucket, of course, uh, of research uh, is represented by the top uh, triangle. It's about ourselves. Eventually, we want to build application that uh, will make our life better, will make our life uh, uh, um, better, not only, again, from an efficient uh, perspective, um, like, um, you know, having access to information, but can we actually provide some guidelines uh, to create those applications to support uh, a better well-being? So, for example, all of us are under constant attack from huge amount of emails and, uh, and WhatsApps and, and uh, you know, social media. Can we create a system that... Uh, can take care of some of this information for us. Uh, when you talk about, you know, individual well-being and individual we uh, uh, health, you can think about monitoring system, individual monitoring that uh, monitor our, our health, our well-being, and actually help us to maintain the balance uh, between uh, our private and our uh, 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 private life and, and work life. Um, it also uh, it is very much related to the way that modern work will be organized in 10, 15 years from now. It will be different from the way that we see them. So all these represent our view of uh, Digital Living 2030 with many, many interesting problems uh, that are related to, again, to gather a lot of data, to optimize a system, and to make sure that uh, people can uh, rely on it and then enjoy uh, uh, from it. And this is uh, um, the main essence and objective of the Digital Living 2030. And uh, with this idea, we came to the Correct Foundation uh, that was generous enough to support it with a very nice grant that will uh, last in the, that will uh, uh, started a year ago and will last for four years more, 
so a total of five years, to support those research that I mentioned. Okay. Uh, so what I want to do is, uh, if I have enough time, is to give you some example, some examples, in each of those uh, directions. Uh, so um, I'll start with a, an application related to environment, environmental infrastructures. Uh, and specifically mobile robots. Uh, so mobile robots or autonomous vehicles are very popular and people think about it as uh, something that is totally new. But uh, first it's nice to see that even in the late uh, uh, 18th century uh, people were thinking about mobile robots. You can see those nice drawings. Uh, so people were thinking uh, about uh, a mobile robot in a different way. They visualized it in a different way that we see it today. This uh, nice uh, picture of Edward Ellis from 1868. Uh, but at the same time, you can see that um, in uh, um, the electric dog uh, represent a small, uh, you know, autonomous vehicle uh, that was. Uh, um, I think uh, presented in the uh, uh, seventh in the in the sorry in the 1919, and was basically uh, moved or triggered by a beam of light. You can see in the left side uh, a person that is moving that mobile robot by a beam of light. And um, in a way, you know, uh, many of the vehicles today or the small. Uh, you know, AGVs, uh, they work uh, either by light or by other sensors, but uh, many of uh, the concepts remain uh, similar to those uh, uh, 20, exactly, sorry, uh, 100 years ago. So this is how people envision mobile robot. And when you uh, look at, uh, sorry, when you look at on a mobile robot uh, in a modern life, people have a lot of uh, other ideas. So I... Uh, always like to show this movie. I don't know if you remember it, the Minority Report movie. Um, of Tom Cruise, you know, those uh, smart agents that are looking for suspects, those spiders uh, that are moving uh, and looking for a sign of a, any sign of a, a, a living, a creature that they can, so, you know, I don't know if you remember, if you didn't see this movie, I, uh, I urge you to see, by the way, many or many of the innovation that we see today, you know, uh, regarding AI agents and uh, robotics and so on, they appear in movies, in science fiction movies, so even before it comes to science, people are inspired and have uh, very good ideas, and it's always a uh, a source of inspiration. So uh, this is how people uh, saw mobile robot at, at those days. And what we thought, let me see, I don't see, uh, there is a hidden slide somewhere. I don't see it. Um, let me see if I have a slide of how uh, people think about mobile. I don't see that. Okay. So, you know, today when people uh, think about mobile robot, uh, of course, uh, autonomous vehicles are only one direction, but people are thinking about small um, agents that could uh, bring food and, and beverages to uh, the right place at the right time. Or they think about small uh, vehicles that can uh, actually take care of uh, infrastructure, or they think about small ambulances again, autonomous ambulances that will move uh, very rapidly to an area of an accident and uh, uh, could provide, you know, first aid and so on. So, uh, and in the same way, if you think about an infrastructure of smart cities, you can think about small robots that are moving on pipelines uh, and fixing or uh, finding problems in, in, in those uh, water uh, uh, pipelines or sewage uh, leakage in pipelines uh, and so on. And, uh, uh, and the idea was that many of those uh, applications, new applications, they require an interaction between 
uh, a lot of uh, those robots. Uh, and the idea was uh, that in all those systems, what you really want to do is to create, again, um, a probability, a heat map, that represent uh, the reality in a digital way. Uh, and, you know, I have uh, an example of such a map uh, that shows uh, in Germany areas that uh, are prone to uh, accidents. So people are analyzed uh, based on, again, on and a lot of data. They analyzed the road system. And all those uh, red places are places with the uh, uh, congestion and places that are prone to accidents. So if you have such a heat map and you have, uh, you know, a swarm of small robots, small ambulance robots, you can actually move them. Yeah, you can actually move them to those areas. Uh, and this is uh, what you see. And in the, same, in the same way, when you talk about smart cities, you can input a lot of... Uh, uh, um, information from the physical world to the digital one, like, uh, for example, the transportation, the traffic, the temperature, uh, uh, feeds from social uh, media and social networks, information from uh, cellular data, uh, and so on. So uh, basically, you can actually create a heat map related to different applications. So the one that I was mentioning was related to autonomous ambulances. But you can think about a heat map that represents, uh, you know, areas where you want, uh, a, you know, a, a police agent, a, an autonomous police agent to be in order to prevent the next uh, crime. And again, I'm referring, if you didn't see this uh, movie of Tom Cruise, um, again, you are, uh, I think it was called uh, um, Minor Reality or something like that. Uh, uh, minority reports or minority report. So all those uh, applications can be very much relevant. Firefighters, fi uh, water uh, uh, leakage in pipeline where you know, autonomous robots will move around. And a lot of location-based uh, services, you know, food and drinks, medicine, uh, things that uh, are now called uh, last mile deliveries, all those micro motion, uh, uh, smart uh, bicycles and, uh, and the sc scooters that can provide uh, uh, materials and move people in the last mile. So all of it can be related to this probability heat map. And, and you don't see a lot of research in this area. You see a lot around how to build um, a vehicle that can actually absorb information in a smart way how to, uh, to make the right decision when this vehicle is moving. But what about the swarm uh, of robots, the way that they inf provide information to one another and the way that they move? And the idea was to, of course, uh, based on this heat map, to create a mathematical model. I, I don't want to go into the details, of course, but just to explain that uh, there are uh, stochastic optimization schemes, uh, if we talked about uh, collecting the data and analyzing it, uh, this is the data science part. But now you have the heat map, you have all this information, and now you need to optimize the system. So for example, for example if I go back to the ambulance uh, use case, how you, did, how you move those uh, small ambulances, uh, autonomous uh, ambulances around the city. So you need to create a mathematical scheme that will get the, um, uh, the mode, the, the model from uh, uh, the data, will optimize the movement of uh, the swarm of robots, will take new measurement, will uh, take some action, and action can be moving the vehicle to another area and actually sensing uh, what's going on there or integrating another source of information. This is another option of an action. And then based on the new information, absorbing it, updating the heat map, making a new decision, and moving forward. So it's a scheme. It's an ongoing scheme where you absorb information. There is a lot of, um, uh, uh, a lot of um, um, 
the decision are related to what we call reinforcement learning. How much you want to exploit the information that you have, for example, staying in the same condition and exploiting information, uh, rather than moving and explore a new area. So there is a lot of uh, work that uh, is already available and can be applied to, to these cases. And uh, uh, the, second thing, the, the second thing that is very relevant is, um, are we going to support um, a central control scheme that absorb all the information from all the vehicles and all the sensors in the smart cities in order to reach optimality? And of course, it creates a huge amount of uh, you know, challenges. So first, you have to collect all the information to one place. You have to merge it in the right uh, way. Uh, you have to synchronize it. You create a lot of uh, uh, flow of information in different networks. You have to deal with energy because all those sensors are sensing all the time and they should send it to this uh, you know, central computer, so to speak. And then you need to make the decision and you know, disseminate and, and send them back to uh, uh, all the agents. And again, we are talking about decisions that are taken sometime uh, in a tenth of the second or even in a, in a faster way. Can, can you do that? Uh, or maybe a better way is to, to give some, you know, autonomous when you control those uh, swarms. And, uh, and, and this is exactly uh, what we were uh, uh, preaching and working when we uh, wrote this uh, book, Search and Foraging, that actually take into account that uh, swarm of uh, you know, animals like ants that are looking for food are not controlled centrally. They, each, of, uh, each agent or each ant has its own uh, sensors and they send to each other some information by pheromone deploying uh, uh, mechanisms such that they can actually control the movement of uh, the swarm in a very optimal way. And uh, this is exactly uh, the type of algorithms that uh, we find very much relevant uh, for uh, autonomous uh, robots or autonomous agents or autonomous vehicles in many cases. Here you see those ants that are looking for food and they uh, signal to each other and they are moving towards an uh, area, you see them standing when they found some food. And if you analyze it uh, on a large scale, you see that this is a very efficient mechanism that solves a lot of the problem that I was mentioning before. It solves the problem of uh, transferring all the information to a single place. It is much more robust. Um, so if there is uh, some... Uh, uh, the network falls, uh, it's not uh, preventing any one of the agents uh, on, a, on a local level to, to make decision and to move on. And um, again, um, there are two or three books that uh, we wrote on this area. And again, what you can see, let me try to see if I can apply it, I'm not sure. Okay, there. The clip is not connected, but what you can see is three agents in the bottom, and you see the heat map that represent uh, the target. In this case, it can be, again, either you can think about uh, the next accident or uh, where the uh, vehicle or the robot is a, a small ambulance, or you can think about the next tr crime. And each of the agents uh, share uh, a slightly different uh, view of uh, reality based on, on its own uh, sensors and some of the information that he gathered from the network. And uh, if I could run the, the um, I could run the clip, you could see that these three uh, autonomous uh, uh, vehicles that are represented by those blue rectangles, they are moving and looking for uh, the target that is also dynamic. If the, 
if the target is static, it's not moving, uh, it's quite easy to find uh, an optimal way to catch it. But if we are talking about a moving target, the problem becomes uh, extremely difficult in a large scale. Uh, so this is uh, uh, one of the directions that I was mentioning. And another one uh, would be, uh, for example, uh, the individual well-being uh, um, part. And uh, the idea was here again, based on uh, a team that consists of data scientists, applied mathematicians, or OR, and uh, human factors, is to think about all those uh, devices and sensors that will be collecting information about our health. Now, it can be a trivial thing like blood pressure and beat rate, but uh, you can think about glucose level. You can think about uh, thousands of parameters uh, that can be collected uh, by sensors, some of them wearable sensors, so, you know, smart, uh, smart wearable some of them by sensor that will be implemented in our body and will uh, be transmitted. They will transmit their information to phones or to smart uh, watch or to uh, other devices. And in a way, all this information will be collected and it sometimes should be sent to uh, a, a center, some center, where decision can make and also where a learning on a larger scale can be taken. So, you know, if you think about those devices, they can uh, learn the way that uh, you as a human being is performing. But if you want to uh, learn general trends about how people that are suffering, for example, from diabetes, how uh, the uh, stage of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the glucose level is... Uh, is uh, progressing in time, it's better to collect it from many, many people. So there is a lot of uh, reasons to transfer some of the information to a center, uh, to, a, to a general center that will learn it. And there are many ideas of, uh, again, how do you activate all those sensors? Again, if you think about situation in 10 years from now, where potentially we could have thousands of sensors around us, both in the environment and in our wearable and in our body, it doesn't make sense that you need all to, to activate them all the time. It will create a lot of uh, problem with energy, uh, with radiation, uh, and without uh, necessarily providing uh, new information. So the idea is to, uh, to, uh, to again, to find a scheme like the one that we uh, discussed before with the mobile robot. So here again, optimization scheme where you operate those sensors in a way that you obtain accurate information. You save power. So power can be, again, power can be uh, related to simply, uh, you know, electricity in those sensors that is uh, uh, or the energy that is uh, sometimes uh, uh, limited, or it can be, you know, baud rate or capacity in the network of how much information you want to transfer. And at the same time, you want to learn. So, again, the main scheme of exploration, exploitation is also happening here. And you want to both to optimize the system and to learn it and to... Uh, uh, deal uh, with the trade-off between monitoring accurately the state of the patient and at the same time saving power and capacity. And uh, again, I don't want to go into the mathematical details, but uh, what we have implemented is um, what we call a partially observed Markov decision process, where basically we learn the state of the systems and uh, at each epoch, we update the information and we try to monitor as good as we can the state of the system. And what you see here, 
This is an example of one patient, uh, and we got real data uh, related to uh, uh, diabetes patients uh, with uh, different level of uh, glucose in their blood. And you can see, for example, here in this uh, simulation, you can see the blue line that represents the glucose level in uh, the blood of a patient that moved from uh, stage 4 to stage 1. And what you can see in the dashed line here are uh, the belief state of or what, uh, what is uh, the belief state based on the sensors that we are operating uh, regarding that patient. And you see that uh, with small lags, actually, you can sense well the state of the system. And what you see on the, on the bottom uh, graph is uh, the decision which type of uh, sensors you're activating at each time. So, for example, uh, maybe in the beginning you're activating four sensors, so uh, this is the number of sensors, to learn quickly what is the state of uh, the system. But then, at certain time, you don't need a lot of sensor. You need basically only one sensor and maybe sometimes two sensors to, uh, two sensors to, uh, to learn about the patient. And of course, it is, it is related to learning because when you monitor one patient or many patients, you learn that there is a peak after lunch and afterwards it, uh, it, uh, it gets back to the normal level. So you can use both the internal information and external information about other patients to personalize uh, the monitoring scheme for that specific patient. Uh, any question about, uh, about uh, this example of, uh, of the body area network? Or the previous one, the one related to autonomous vehicles? Okay, I hope it's uh, clear, and uh, if not, again, please uh, just interrupt and, and let me know. So uh, the last one, uh, again, I want to, to uh, talk about, sorry, is, uh, you know, an example of a social uh, organization type of research. And uh, uh, this is the research I was referring to earlier when I talked about wisdom of the crowd. And again, if I, I have one slide, so I'll just give you uh, the general sense of um, what we're trying to do here. So as you, will, uh, you know well, uh, wisdom of the crowd is based on the fact that if you collect uh, information from a large uh, group of people, you can, in many cases, reach uh, a very good decision. And, and the classic example that people were using is if you want to estimate the height of some uh, building. So you can show it to people and, you know, someone will say, I think it's uh, 15 meters and others will say, no, it's 20 meters. And when you collect it and, and a lot of people are joining this process, eventually you can converge to the right height of that uh, building. So uh, uh, this is a very strong concept, and you can find it also in learning. When uh, in learning, we call it as ensemble or boosting or weak classifier. So if you take a lot of uh, um, learning models that are basically weak, they are not so good, and you collect them together, and you make a decision based on all of them, in many ways, you can improve your accuracy. Uh, however, in both cases, specifically the first one in the wisdom of the crowd, the idea is that somehow there is a ground uh, truth level and people are symmetrically distributed around it. So uh, if I talk again about the height of the building, you know, the building might be 16 meters and some people will think that it is higher, some people will think that it is lower, but eventually if you collect enough information, you will reach the uh, right estimation uh, about the, the, the height of that building. However, in reality, uh, in many cases, this assumption that people are distributed evenly around uh, uh, ground truth is, is not the case. 
And instead of calling it uh, wisdom of the crowd, we actually thought of uh, calling it wisdom in the crowd. And the, and the idea is the following, that uh, you might find area where only small portion of the population will know about it. So think about uh, a situation where you release uh, a, medical, a medical case in the internet and uh, instead of just going to one doctor to, to reach a second opinion or to, to two doctors to reach a second opinion, you can actually release it in the internet and, and, and doctors can work like Uber drivers. They can actually, in their free time, open uh, that uh, you know, application, reveal the file, and give their, you know, uh, uh, their ideas or their diagnosis. And, and if you think about this case, specifically in an uncontrolled environment like the internet, you might think that in some medical say, cases, few of the uh, doctors will be experts, while the others uh, won't be an expert. And if you just rely on the wisdom of the crowd and you just average over all of them, you can reach a wrong decision. Again, the idea is that uh, uh, those decisions are not distributed around a ground truth, but they represent a level of expertise that uh, those experts have. And if you think you know, um, about other cases, legal cases that can be released in the internet, and even cases, if I go back to uh, the idea that each one of us in 10, 20 years could be represented by a digital agent, think about, again, a doctor that is making a decision, and there is a deep network agent that learns all the decisions that this person is making. After a while, uh, this agent can you know, uh, replace that doctor, can work instead of him, you know, can work while this doctor is sleeping. You know, thinking, so in a way, we could uh, work uh, uh, while we are not uh, physically there. Our digital image or digital agent could work for us. Uh, and again, it sounds maybe... Uh, counterintuitive, but if you think about software, so company, they build software like ERP and, and so on, and then, you know, uh, the software is doing all the work that uh, uh, represent all the knowledge that was uh, incorporated in it, and nobody expects, uh, you know, uh, people from IBM or Oracle to, uh, uh, to make decision, uh, dynamic decision in ERP system. There is a this software that represents all the knowledge that uh, could be integrated in the software. In the same way, the AI agent at a personal level could work for each of us uh, personally. And, and again, when you think about it, and you think about the internet, all those AI agents, again, you cannot just average them and ask for a wisdom of the crowd. What you really want to do is to find those experts in the crowds depending on the decisions that you are trying to make and uh, uh, either ignore all the others or give them uh, a much higher weight when you make your decision. And uh, the way that we approach this problem is to look uh, how people make decisions uh, collectively uh, and try to find some metric that represent the vicinity between, vicinity between experts. And I will, I will use again the example I, I started, uh, I, I used before. Just think about a very specific medical case. You have um, a, a specific type of a lung cancer that uh, you release uh, uh, to this crowd of experts. So if there are two or three doctors that are experts in this area, in many cases when they will, they will encounter such a problem, they will be very consistent with each other. They will be close to each other. While all the other physicians, all the other doctors will be somehow distributed around many other uh, uh, um, decisions or ideas. So if you can actually measure the distance between those experts along many, many decisions, you can easily find people that are experts in certain areas and give them 
a higher uh, probability or a higher weight when you reach a decision. And actually we created, and maybe uh, I can send it to you, a small application uh, that um, it's, an, uh, it's, a, it's a smartphone based application that show you uh, pictures of uh, famous artists. And uh, what you find out is that, uh, you know, most of us, when, when they reach, a, you know, uh, a paint of uh, someone like uh, uh, Van Gogh or Picasso, certainly from a certain stage, they can recognize it. But if people are requested to uh, find some, uh, 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 to classify those pictures uh, of, let's say, Michelangelo, or uh, some earlier painters that are less known, uh, you'll see that uh, many of them are reaching wrong decision. Uh, and the idea is, again, to find those experts that can identify those paintings uh, in, a, in a right way and use them to, uh, to classify those uh, pieces of arts accordingly. And, um, You'll see when you write, and I can, if, I can send you the link of that application, and I, you'll, you immediately you'll get a, a score how, how, how uh, you classify those uh, piece of art, but uh, I can actually send you the collective decision based on all of you, and you'll see that uh, you can identify specific people that are very good uh, in identifying specific painters or specific uh, piece of art. And this actually represents many areas of knowledge that we are uh, dealing with today. So this is uh, the wisdom in the crowd, I would say, type of a project. Uh, so, you know, I want to leave some uh, few minutes just for question. Uh, I would sum and say uh, that uh, the role of AI in digital living is critical uh, because in fact, this is the mechanism that enable us to uh, make decision in uh, the digital modeling of uh, the physical world. There are a lot of new opportunities when you think about applications that can be generated on large scale. So uh, shared economy that started with companies like Airbnb and Uber can be spread around to many, many, many areas like sharing food and sharing energy and sharing uh, any resources and do it in a, in a smarter way. However, they all require uh, an infrastructure that will gather a lot of data that will make a smart decision based on AI system and will know how to deliver it back in a way that people will be happy uh, and will uh, it, it will be efficient to work with. Uh, this type of replication requires new models, new metrics, new measures that uh, are not uh, always relevant to the physical world that we uh, used to work uh, uh, in so far. And, uh, it, it, and the last uh, uh, point I should mention, that it triggers also serious ethical question about making decisions that are not always uh, under the engineering slash computer science um, umbrella, but require also people from uh, uh, you know, law and philosophy and, uh, and, and many other uh, science that uh, could take part in this, uh, 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 you know, new organization of ideas and infrastructures and applications uh, for the benefit of all of us, uh, either in 2030 or 2040 and so on. So by that, I will conclude uh, my talk. I hope that... Uh, uh, I was uh, clear and uh, I open it for any question if you have. Um, Professor, may I request you to please minimize the presentation on your screen and move on to the Q&A. Some viewers have posted questions. Okay, so... Uh, you can go ahead and select the questions that you would like to answer. Okay, um, I don't see the Q&A. Guys, do you know where is the Q&A? Uh, should I stop sharing or? Yes, you could stop sharing. On the left side panel of your home screen, there should be Pause. a button for Q&A. Ah, okay, Q&A. Yeah, okay. I don't know.
about this application. Yes. Okay, um, I open it. I don't know if you can see it, but... Uh, you could just read out the question you're about to answer, sir, and I people can it, reply. I don't, I, don't see, I don't see any question. I open the Q&A. There are polls and Q&A, but in Q&A, I don't see any questions. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and read out some of the questions that we can see on our portal. Sure. Please go ahead. All right. The first one is, uh, how can we apply AI to electrical and electronic engineering? So many examples, you know. Uh, how can we apply AI or can we apply AI? What was the specific question? How? It's just how can we apply it to electrical and e electrical engineering? Okay, so you know, it, it can start with the devices of, uh, you know, we work with companies like uh, uh, HP, Applied Materials, Intel, they all use AI to optimize, uh, you know, the, the, the smallest component uh, uh, in the system. Uh, you know, to better sense what is going on there and to make uh, uh, the design of those compi components uh, more uh, adaptable to the environment. And, and it goes, you know, up to, um, uh, you know, infra large infrastructures, networks, and, uh, uh, and, you know, energy networks that, uh, again, uh, sense a lot of information and optimize the way that they are operating based on that. Um, I was just, I can just give a very quick example. You know that uh, in smart grid today, if I go to a, a larger system, when you want to transfer electricity from one point to another, it's not only a question of uh, uh, um, the different routes that you can uh, select and uh, uh, in many cases, they are uh, based on auctions. So many companies are proposing online some prices how to uh, acquire those uh, network links. But in many ways, it is based on learning the demand of people to electricity. So you can uh, find many different layers of AI that learn how people are using energy or electricity in this way and what is the best way to optimize the system to provide it in a cost-effective way. So many, so many areas are, are open in uh, you know, electrical engineering to, uh, to the use of AI. Thank you, Professor. Another question is, data is ga getting gathered in huge amounts. Could we have a framework where academia and government could make a portal which could have data dumps of all the data collected by them and could this be used by any industry yes so so uh, this is a, a very good question and actually is is being uh, taken place in some places uh, so for example in in israel the government uh, made a decision to open some um, uh, healthcare and medical databases uh, uh, to, uh, for researchers in academia and in companies. It is based on the fact that in Israel we have a system where we collect the data. Some of the HMOs are uh, already collecting data for 20 or uh, 15 years. And it's a small environment, so uh, there is a lot of data points on, on patients. And uh, this was a decision that uh, once you release this data, th those data sets, uh, it can actually increase and uh, increase innovation and uh, enhance innovation. And in the same way, uh, you can uh, do it when you release information about transportation. In fact, in digital living, the whole idea is that if we have uh, central databases that can represent reality, as I mentioned, in a digital way, you could actually open it to many companies and to academia to work on top on the, of it and, uh, uh, and uh, apply uh, many new uh, ideas and, uh, and new uh, research and application on, on top of that data. And, and we have such an example also in Tel Aviv University with the Smart Transportation uh, Institute 
that gather information from cellular providers, from leasing, uh, car, leasing car companies, and uh, general uh, GIS uh, uh, systems in order to provide an infrastructure uh, for smart uh, transportation applications. So this is a very good way to uh, increase collaboration and uh, enhance innovation. Yes. All right, so there is a question which is uh, about one of the larger conclusions that you presented. How can AI treat ethical questions? How, how can AI, sorry? Trigger ethical questions. Oh. So, you know, just think about uh, all those decisions that are, are made by uh, AI and will be made by AI uh, in an automatic way. You know, just think about, I mean, the, the most trivial example is those, those autonomous vehicles uh, that uh, they drive very fast and suddenly they censor a person crossing the street and then can either hit that person or they can actually try to move to another lane with a very high probability that the, the people in the car will be injured. So this is a terrible, a complicated uh, ethical question. And the problem uh, for us as human beings, if you think about it, is um, the idea that we have to somehow program it in advance and decide what we should do. So, you know, if a, a car driver is driving and making a wrong decision, nobody will blame him. You know, if he decides, uh, I mean, he will be blamed on, on the fact that he maybe drove in, uh, in, in a wrong way, but, but there will be no ethical question because, in fact, he, he, he got uh, uh, a decision in a few seconds. He had uh, no time to think about it, no time to program it. But suddenly, this AI agent uh, needs that someone will make those decisions, you know, in a cold blood when he sits in an air-conditioned uh, room and will uh, write a code that will maybe cause a, a person uh, crossing the road to be killed. And it, it raises a lot of questions. Can, can you do such a thing? Uh, is it deterministic? How can you evaluate uh, those probabilities? Uh, and, uh, you know, we even thought, we talked about this uh, issue, and we even thought that in some cases you need to allow some randomness effect so people that believe in, uh, you know, uh, randomness or God, or you can call it in any name, will have uh, a chance to, uh, to think that uh, in some way there is a, an ethical decision that can be taken uh, uh, without uh, analyzing, analyzing it in advance uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, crushing into a very ethical uh, uh, problem that in some cases cannot be solved. And this is, of course, one example. You just think about distribution of uh, goods or uh, the way that you even a, you know a clear application a, a transportation you decide that you give uh, a priority to a certain lane in the road uh, is it ethical you know when you talk about uh, uh, you know public transportation maybe it is ethical because more people are there, but uh, when you think about smart cities, not always it is clear if more people will, will be uh, will get advantage of that. And think about energy networks. Think about uh, uh, water networks. Think about all those networks that need to take uh, uh, you need to take a decision on. On and uh, they are all involved. Some questions that could be ethical. Okay, so another question, sir, is what's the role of AI in a circular economy? In, in what? In economy? A circular economy. Okay, so first I'm not familiar with the term circular economy, uh, but uh, of course economy is uh, based on uh, the fact that uh, you collect uh, resources, demand, and supply from 
uh, a lot of uh, entities and you merge them together. And in this way, of course, AI is very important because it can help you understand the demand uh, in, a, in a better way and provide you a better way uh, to supply this demand. I, I, uh, di I didn't talk about circular economy, but in shared economy, which is a very important field, uh, is totally based on AI. The fact that uh, you can have a resource that can uh, be utilized in a better way when you know uh, better how people are using these resources is uh, uh, fully based on, on AI engines. I hope I uh, answered some of these questions. Yes, yes, you did, sir. The last question uh, is about would the introduction of AI not reduce the significance of the human workforce, which would significantly hinder the personal growth of individuals based on knowledge coming with work experience? Yeah. So, you know, this whole part, I didn't have time to talk about it, but uh, of course, uh, and this is, by the way, another ethical question. Uh, many, uh, many um, tasks that people are performing uh, could or would be performed by AI uh, engine robots, mechanism and so on. And of course it is related both to the fact that uh, uh, when you replace those people, uh, you risk uh, uh, their work. And second, uh, it is related to uh, the question how people will work in those environments. And uh, first, I think that, uh, you know, I think that um, a lot of uh, jobs will be destroyed by AI, but at the same time, a lot of jobs will be created by AI. And like uh, other, you know, wave of revolutions that people thought that uh, there will be no work. I think that uh, also in the AI people are exaggerating, and in a way, a lot of uh, a lot of new job will be available. It is true, like any resource, it is true that uh, there might be imbalance between developing and developed country or poor area and, and richer area. I mean, countries or companies or individuals that will know how to better use AI will get a huge advantage and that can create uh, uh, a lot of um, tension and uh, ethical problems uh, uh, for those that will, be, that will be left behind. And uh, this is indeed a serious problem that uh, we need to address. Uh, and part of it is related to uh, the way that ethics should be part of it. At the same time, I think that um, if we will know how to address it, it will uh, enable people to do things that they do uh, better than AI agents. There are many, many areas that uh, still are not covered by AI. You know, you can think about consciousness, emotion, a lot of the decision that uh, still people are doing better than AI. And, uh, and I think that, that we'll find more and more people uh, moving to, to those directions and using their experience uh, to develop those directions. So I think that uh, if we know how to control it well, eventually it can create a, a better environment also in the works uh, space. All right, that was the last question, sir. We would like to extend our thanks to you, Professor, for an excellent presentation and to all participants for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much.